The Watership Down podcast is intended for listeners who are familiar with the plot. There may be spoilers. This episode is scripted by Newell Fisher, Liam Michaela and John Ruths and is narrated, recorded and edited by Newell Fisher. Hello and welcome to the Watership Down podcast episode 94 in which we will be introducing the 1996 follow-up to the original 1972 novel, Tales from Watership Down. I have received to my amazement no corrections on my science from last week's episode, which I plan to take some time going over at this point. Either this is because I need to give that more time, or I got everything right, which I doubt. In any case, let's get back to our favourite down. Introduction to Tales from Watership Down Before we go any further, let's address the Lendry in the Honeycomb with regard to this book. It is probably fair to say that the number of people who, who love the original 1972 novel but dislike Tales from Watership Down is a lot higher than those who feel the opposite, for we are now very firmly in revisionist territory. It is a very different book to the original novel, to the extent that I hesitate to even call it a sequel, now that I am getting down to the business of looking at it in detail. For a start, it is not a novel. It is an anthology of short stories, which are grouped into three sections. What's more, it is only the last of those three sections that definitively returns us to Watership Down in order to fill us in on some of what happened after chapter 50 of the 1972 novel, the end of the main narrative. When I first bought it, as soon as it became available, I must admit I just wanted to skip ahead to that part, rather than have to plough through two whole sections of stories of Ella Carrera first. In my current Kindle edition, the narrative is 250 pages in total. Part 1 takes up 92 pages, or 36%. Part 2 takes up 55 pages, or 21%. And Part 3 takes up 107 pages, or 42%. In the end, I did not skip ahead and enjoyed the tales of Ella Carrera as they were intended. But all the while I was reading them, there was still an impatience to get to the... What? Good stuff? Meat on the bones? What I'd actually bought it for? Would it have been better to have part three first? Possibly. Perhaps, but perhaps there was a feeling the tales of Ella Carrera might have gone unread. Or to intersperse the eleven stories of Ella Carrera among the seven set on Watership Down. The math doesn't really work, though. Or what about two separate works, one called Tales of Ella Carrera? Well, probably because neither work would probably have been considered long enough back then, though in these days of non-paper-based reading it might have worked. In any case, on reading the introduction to this book, the reader of the original novel is faced with an entirely different read to that previous one, one that has probably put many people off, and that is actually understandable, putting on my originalist hat for just a moment. However, the fact remains that this book which was written by Richard Adams just over a quarter of a century after the original novel, represents the last work he ever wrote about our rabbit heroes on their down, and as such, it deserves our undivided and serious attention. I will also be addressing the issue of whether some of the content of the book, in particular the first two sections, represent some of the outtakes from the original novel. In light of that thought, hasn't Rousby Woof always seemed a tiny bit out of place in the original narrative? Holding that thought for a moment, here are some thoughts on the book that Leah Michaela sent me in May and June last year. <music> Leah Michaela on the Tales of Ella Carrera. I've been wondering in which order the stories came when Richard Adams was telling his daughters stories about rabbits that would only later be written into the book. Were there first stories of rabbits leaving their previous home, finding a new one and defending it? Or were there first stories of a, of a mythical rabbit hero, perhaps some old fairy tales retold under that name and combined until they became tales of their own? Did stories of the rabbits in this world and rabbits of the mythical world come intertwined or separate? Were stories about Ella Herrera written specifically to that part of the story they are used in? Or was there a collection to choose from which of the various stories would fit in which place? Maybe it varies story by story. Tales from Watership Down had a very draft-like update about how life went on on Watership Down, and the collection of Ella Carrera stories that seemed like exercises in the genres of folklore, because so many genres were covered. 
When Tales came out, my friend hated it because it seemed so unfinished and draft-like, and I was utterly fascinated by the El Ahrara stories. It seems to me that, especially in the first part of Tales from Watership Down, the stories are written to formulas that have been inspired by some theories on folklore. In Watership Down, the mythological stories of El Ahrara were more literary, but their influence on the life of characters and how the life of the characters turned in the stories seems to have taken inspiration from folklore and theories of it. The stories of El Ahrara in the world of Prince Rainbow and King Darzin seem indeed to be part of the same continuum, like it had been another larger rabbit story going on in a different world than the Sandalford Watership rabbits, but intertwined with it. The tale of Rousby Woof is clearly a standalone story, much like many of the stories in Tales. It also seems to be a story of a specific folklore genre, namely Tales of a Stupid Ogre. Rousby Wolf being more ogreish in nature than, for example, King Darzin, who is left a bit ambiguous so that you can read stories about him thinking he's either human or animal, but it's never said which animal he is, apparently a city-building vegetarian animal who practices agriculture and whose children are about the same size as grown-up rabbits. However, I think even if the tale of Rousby Wolf stands out, it has probably its reason to be in the place it is in the book. It's told in a moment of peace before the final battle, when rabbits have settled down and having, having started to live their domestic life, they are telling also a story set in a more domestic setting than the earlier stories where El Ahrara travels from one kingdom to another. I've been thinking whether some of the short stories in Tales existed already at the time or before Warship Down was written, even if some or most of them were written afterwards. My theory is that there had been a continuum, the ones with Prince Rainbow and King Darzin, that was composed and written around the same time with each other. And then standalone stories were written at different times. Some may be around the same time, some later. No idea, though. Am I anywhere close to how it must actually have been? I wonder if the topic has ever been touched on in some interview or not. Thank you, Leah, for those interesting thoughts on the tales of El Ahrara we are about to encounter. Are some or all of them actually of the same vintage as the original novel? Captain of Owsler John Ruths has also offered his thoughts on the book. John Ruths on Tales from Watership Down Tales from Warship Down is both exciting and also a relief. There is no separating those feelings, they are stitched firmly together. As with Warship Down, I heard about tales from my brother, who was a full-time college student in Wisconsin, one state to the east of Minnesota. He sent me a copy, and again, excitement and relief for me. I immediately set about reading it. By the time tales were published, Richard Adams was well into his mid-seventies, and also a good couple of decades away from his own departure from our world. Much like Hazel in Warship Down, he still had a good number of seasons in front of him. Thankfully, this book would not see a UK first, then the US release. By the time the book was released, I am certain that Adams and his publishers knew full well our American love for his world. We learn a bit about the three-part structure in the book in its introduction. I don't think there's much to say on this, except that we learn that there is some additional continuity between this book and Warship Down. A couple of these stories are referenced in Warship Down, and there are some El Ahrara and Rabsuttle stories that take place when these two heroes are on their way home from their horrific encounter with the Black Rabbit and his Owsler. These are, of course, also referenced in Warship Down. These things not only make this book a book to read unto itself, but also fills in some details not as explored in the original novel. A very neat idea. After the introduction, we get about one third of a page on the pronunciation of El Ahrara. Needless to say, I was happy to discover that my pronunciation was in accordance with Richard Adams, the inventor of El Ahrara. Introduction and the Structure of Tales from Watership Down Thank you for your thoughts on the book, John. As John mentions, there is a definite theme to each part of the book. It begins with a brief note in which Richard Adams makes it clear how the name El Ahrara should be pronounced, with the second syllable less stressed and the two R's slightly rolled, which I almost manage. Then, in the introduction, he lays out the structure of the book. Part one consists of five, or should that be Hrare, stories of El Ahrara that all rabbits would know, two of which are mentioned in the novel. At the appropriate time, we will discuss those two in that context. 
Part two consists of four of the, quote, many stories that are told of the adventures of Elohara and Rabscuttle during their return from the terrible stone warren of the Black Rabbit of Inlay. As such, it is perhaps the Odyssey to Elohara's Iliad. And then in part three, we get seven, or bigger rare, stories of events that occurred on Watership Down in between chapter 50 of the novel Watership Down and its epilogue. Events that remind us that, no matter how triumphant a victory, in its aftermath, there are still mundane matters to deal with, such as other rabbits and their funny ways. Part 3 also provides us with a few points of Watership Down narrative that at the appropriate times I will submit for consideration for special canon status. I hope to make my case convincingly. So there it is. We are now ready to dive into some tales from Watership Down. Next time, in the first of the tales, Elachrera finds the sense of smell. <laughs>